يسعد ويشرف اتحاد المصريين معا بالمملكة المتحدة أن يقدم لكم سلسلة ندوات تعليمية تحت عنوان معا نتعلم ونستفيد اتحاد المصريين معا بالمملكة المتحدة أسس لجلب المنافع للإخوة المصريين في جميع أنحاء العالم هذا بالإضافة إلى تأسيس وخلق مجتمع يساعد على تقوية الألفة بين أبناء جمهورية مصر العربية في الخارج الهدف من هذه المبادرة هي إتاحة الفرصة لبعض من الخبراء في شتى المجالات لكي يشاركوا بمعلوماتهم وخبرتهم لتعليم وإفادة العامة عبر محاضرات تأتيكم عبر الإنترنت من ثم ترفع المحاضرات على قناة الاتحاد على اليوتيوب The Egyptian Together Union in the UK is honored to introduce a series of educational talks called Together Teach Each Other. The Egyptian Together Union in the UK was established to bring about mutual benefits to our fellow Egyptians all around the world, in addition to providing a community to strengthen the bond between Egyptians abroad. The purpose of this initiative is to provide the stage for professionals in a variety of different fields to share their knowledge to educate the masses live via the internet from which the sessions are uploaded to the Union's YouTube channel. I am glad to introduce Dr. Iman Halawa that's going to be talking about first aid for common pediatric emergencies. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Today our first topic will be the, the first aid for common pediatric emergencies. Uh, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Iman Halawa. I'm a specialty doctor in pediatrics. And today we are going to talk about the common pediatric emergencies that we commonly face these days. Uh, first of all, we have to all of us to prepare a first aid kit that should be available for us at home, any parties, any trips, any outside, any indoor or outdoor activity. Uh, but the question, what will be available in this first aid kit? What we will put in this first aid kit? Sometimes this first aid kit is already prepared, already we get it prepared from the pharmacy. Sometimes we have to replace the missing we, we, we miss or we use. These are the common things that should be available in the first aid kit. This consists of scissors, twisters, a bandage, some saline, uh, some bandage, some gauze swab, uh, some alcohol swab, alcohol pads, and this some elastoplasts. Okay. Also, some medications should be available in this uh, first aid kit, like aspirin and paracetamol. Okay. Also, some creams should be very important in this first aid kit, like a hydrocortisone cream, if we because it's sometimes needed in certain inmates. This is the first aid kit that we, this is the first topic we are going to talk about today. Uh, the second topic we are going to talk about today is a shocking. Shocking, if anybody, uh, I'm talking mainly about pediatrics, but it can happen to adults also. Shocking can occur in some small things like peanuts, like uh, any nuts, okay? And in adults can occur in any food, sometimes in rice, sometimes in a piece of chicken, piece of meat, choking can occur with anything, okay? Uh, to how to identify this person or this child is shocking. Shocking to identify the, the child is, or, or an adult is shocking, we can find him that he's unable to speak, unable to speak. Sometimes he cannot breathe or he having noisy breathing, noisy breathing, <sighs> He cannot make a normal noise with breathing. Uh, also, we can identify he's not able to cough forcefully. He tries to cough and he's opening his, his, his handling his neck like this, like the picture, and he cannot cough forcefully to expel what he was shocked in. In extreme cases, this, uh, his skin, lips, and nails can turn dusky or blue. And this is extreme case. Uh, and the next step, he will lose consciousness because there is no more oxygen going to his lungs for oxygenation. So he might lose consciousness after that. The most important in this uh, person who is shocking that we do something called the Hamlet maneuver that we will discuss later. But the Hamlet maneuver, we don't advise if this patient can speak, oh, because if he can speak, he is not shocking very much. So what's Hamlet maneuver? 
and what to do for a person who is struggling. First of all, we advise this child to go do coughing, cough, <coughs> but forcible coughing, forcible effective coughing, effective, effective to expel what he is choked in, like this boy in the first picture, effective coughing. Okay, if this cough failed to expel what is this baby or this child is choked in, the next step is to try some back blows, like this picture, back blows. Back blows, we support the baby from inside, from, from anterior side or the, from the front, and we give back blows for his back. How many back blows? We give five, five back blows, okay? And observe after these five back blows, did this nut or this food that he was shocked in came out and he restored his breathing or not? If not, if he didn't restore, we can do something called abdominal thrust. Abdominal thrust is like this picture. We, with the, the other encircles the, the child or the shocked person from, the, from back to behind and presses over his upper abdomen. And we'll see some videos for this link. This is an example for the back blows. Back blow for an adult. He should support from the front and give this back blows to the, to the back. Five back blows. It's five, then reassess the person who was shocked. Is this is good or not? Is it sufficient or not? If it is sufficient and the baby and the, the, the man can breathe or the shocked person can breathe, it's okay. If not, we proceed to the abdominal thrust. This is the five back blows. This is a child doing the five back blows. We support from the front and give five back blows with the dorsum of the hand, like this, five times. This is another picture for the abdominal thrust. As you see, the adult or the rescuer is in, encircling the, 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 uh, the shocked person from the front and pressing on the lower part of the chest and the upper part of the abdomen, upper part. Here is the direction where the abdominal thrust inwards and upwards, like the arrow, inwards and upwards, so that to expel anything that this person or this child or this adult is choked in. Now we'll see this video to see, to see about the shocking. Choking can happen when a piece of food gets stuck in the windpipe or throat and blocks the airway, making it impossible to breathe. If you think someone is choking, it's important to stay calm and help them to clear the obstruction as fast as possible. Start by asking them, are you choking? If they can't breathe, cough or make any noise, then they need your help straight away. Cough it out. Encourage them to cough and remove any obvious obstruction from their mouth. Slap it out. If coughing fails to work, you need to give up to five sharp back blows. To do this, help them lean forwards, supporting their upper body with one hand. With the heel of your other hand, that's this bit at the bottom, give them five sharp back blows between their shoulder blades. After each back blow, check their mouth and pick out any obvious obstruction, like food. Squeeze it out. If back blows don't clear the obstruction, give up to five abdominal thrusts. To do this, stand behind them and put your arms around their waist. Clench one hand into a fist and position it between their belly button and the bottom of their chest. With your other hand, grasp your fist and pull sharply inwards and upwards up to five times. After each abdominal thrust, check their mouth. <laughs> If the blockage has not cleared and they still can't breathe, call 999 or 112 for emergency help straight away. To summarize about shocking, so this is called the Hamlet maneuver. This is the, the abdominal thrust is called Hamlet maneuver. We don't know this, do this Hamlet maneuver if the patient is speaking, because as long as the patient is speaking, we don't do it. So if we find the patient with shocking, we ask him, are you shocking? Are you shocking? If it is a child, 
he will he might not recognize to answer but he might point to his neck so we, we start encouraging him to cough in the beginning if the cough is ineffective we do some back blows back blows we do five back blows we slap the back five times and if this fail we do the abdominal thrust or the hamlet maneuver which we encircle the patient and give five abdominal squeezes aiming to expel this shocked thing out. So this is the second topic that we're talking about today. First, we talked about the first aid kit. Second, we talked about the shocking. And the third topic we want to talk about is asthma, bronchial asthma. Bronchial asthma, as we know, is an intermittent disease. We have the patients will have some cough and some wheezes. It's very common in children, okay? How to, to deal with it? What to do? First of all, we have to reassure the child in asthma because if this child gets so pan much panic, he will this cough could, could increase. So first we reassure and keep him calm. And usually the asthmatic patients carry this blue inhaler and this blue inhaler is a rescue inhaler for all asthmatics, for most asthmatics that they have it. And you, we advise children and their caregivers to keep these blue inhalers with children wherever they go. Then we give two puffs of the inhaler. As you see in this photo, we give the puffs through something called the aero chamber. The aero chamber, we put it on the, over the mouse, the mask over the mouse, and give two puffs. First, we have to uh, shake it well, then give one buff and count to 20, and then do it again, shake the puff again, the, the, the inhaler again, and give another puff. Encourage this child to sit down, to loosen his her clothes or his clothes, and to take some steady breath, not deep breath, steady breath. We can give some more puffs. How many puffs can we give? The maximum of 10. 10 puffs, okay? If the patient take 10 puffs and didn't resolve, we, we usually we, we advise to transfer him to the emergency department or A&E department, okay? So we give two puffs, then four puffs, then six puffs, and the maximum is 10 puffs of this blue inhaler, okay? This is the picture. Some uh, older children can they take these puffs orally without this mask, and sometimes it can, so we, we give it through the aero chamber we have shown in the previous slide. Then this is the blue inhaler. It is a Ventolin inhaler and a rescue therapy for most asthmatics. Okay, so if this children or uh, the, this boy didn't respond after 10 puffs and still having some severe wheezes and severe cough and struggling and sucking his ribs and sucking his chest, usually you have to get him to the A&E at, at the spot or as much as urgent as possible. Now we move to the next topic, which is anaphylaxis or allergic reaction. These are common anaphylactic pro triggers that we have these days. Milk could be an, an anaphylactic uh, trigger. Eggs could be anaphylactic triggers. Peanuts, sometimes shrimps or crabs. Sometimes it's related to other foods. Sometimes some medicine can cause this anaphylactic reaction. Sometimes insects, insect bite can cause this anaphylactic reaction. This is the typical photo of a patient with an anaphylactic reaction. You can see how puffy his eyes, okay? He cannot open his eyes from the severe puffiness and severe edema. Sometimes also the lips, the mouth are very swollen, so he cannot, we are afraid from laryngeal edema. This is very serious, anaphylaxis is very serious because if it proceeds to get to the, to the larynx or the air pipes, it could cause suffocation and cause air cannot pass to the lungs and the patient could die from this serious condition. Usually the, uh, the, the, the boy or the child who get anaphylaxis is a known patient of anaphylaxis. He knows that he's allergic to something and he usually given a pen with him to, in the, uh, by the doctor. This pen is called EpiPen. EpiPen is some pen that usually given at rescue 
for allergic patients. And it is called auto injector. What's auto injector? The patient himself or the, of the, or the mom can inject the, the child or the allergic patient with it. Usually, if this allergic reaction happens, the mom is advised or the caregiver or even sometimes the patient himself to remove the cap, to uncap it, to remove it, and to swing the upper part in the upper and lateral part of the thigh, okay? And give this EpiPen or this injection, subcutaneous injection, and hold it for 10 seconds, okay? This is very important because it can save life. This adrenaline or EpiPen can save life for anaphylactic children or allergic children. Okay. Next, we move to the next uh, topic, which is unresponsive person. If you find someone unresponsive, someone who is walking in the street or whatever at school or at a park, someone falls down and become unresponsive. What to do in this condition? Let's see this video together and comment about it. I was at school on my way to lunch and I saw some legs sticking out from behind a table in my classroom. I quickly went in and had a look and saw that my teacher, Miss Faulkner, was lying on the floor and wasn't moving. There was a chair and loads of pens and stuff lying around her as if she'd fallen. So I quickly moved them away so that I wouldn't slip on them and cause a further injury. After I'd made the area safe, I knew that the next thing I should do was to check if she could respond to me. I knelt down next to her and gently shook her shoulders and then said loudly, Hello, can you hear me? Can you open your eyes? What's happened? Miss Faulkner didn't reply. Because she didn't reply, I knew it was serious. So I shouted to get someone to come and help me. Then I checked her airway. I lifted her chin, tilted her head back and listened for normal breathing for 10 seconds. I was also looking to see if her chest was rising and falling like it does when you breathe in and out. At the same time, I listened and tried to feel any breath on my cheek. So as we see in this video, first of all, what did this girl do is checking for her safety, for the rescuer safety, for the first by bystander safety. First of all, she pushed the pens, pushed anything uh, around her not to slip over. So her safety is first. Then she tried, tried to stimulate her teacher. Are you okay? Are you okay? Can you listen to me? She tried to stimulate her. What is wrong? She then realized that she is not responding to her. So the third thing, she's shouting for help. She asked for help. Help me. I need someone to help. I need some shout for help. After that, she checked her airway. She opened her way to check if her way is open and she is breathing or not. She is breathing or not. And after this, we'll see what happens. As you see in this scene, this man is unresponsive and he's falling on the ground. But is this scene safe or not? Definitely it's not safe. Why? Because there's some wires here and some things around him. So if this bystander come approach, he, got, he might get uh, some electric cushion or something from the wires around. So first of all, we should check the safety of the scene if they find someone unresponsive. And the second thing is to stimulate and if the, after this stimulation is, res, is responding or not responding, if it's not responding, we shout for help and then check for breathing. What's breathing? As we saw in the video, this girl tried to listen after opening the airway for the breathing of her, of her teacher. If the child, if the, the, the one who is uh, unresponsive is breathing, we put them in something called recovery position. If this unresponsive person is not breathing, then we have to start something called the CPR or cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So again, this is very important. First of all, check the safety of the scene. You find someone responsive, you, find, you should check if there is 
this scene is safe for me to proceed or not. Sometimes this can occur in a garden and this uh, or a park and there is some broken glasses around. So it's not safe for me to go and, and see this unresponse. I should remove any unsafe thing around me. Then to stimulate this unresponsive person, then shout for help, please help me, please help me and open the airway and check if this one is breathing or not. And accordingly, we have to put him, if he's breathing in the recovery position and he's not breathing, we put, we start the resuscitation or the CPR. This is the procedure we use for checking this child is breathing or not. We open the airway, we open the airway by head tilt, shin lift. We opening this head tilt, as you see in this man, a person is opening the head and tilting chin, his chin to open his airway. And this man is looking for chest movement and is hearing and feeling any breath sounds or any air coming out of this unresponsive child. So it's look, listen, and feel. Look for chest rise and chest movements listen for air movements and feel airy, any air coming in and out of this. If th this is how to check if he's breathing or not. This is another photo for checking for the breathing. We check he's looking for the chest rise, he's approaching to look, listen and feel, okay? So what's the recovery position? If I found someone who is breathing, but he's still unresponsive, but breathing, we have to put him in something something called recovery position. What's a recovery position? Recovery position is some position that we prevent the tongue from falling backward and obstructing airway. And we help this person who is already breathing to continue his breathing. This is how we do the recovery position. First of all, I bend the elbow of this child, the opposite elbow, and bend the op flex the knee or bend the knees. So I bend the elbows and bend the knees. Then I rotate to this side, to, to, to my side, rotate it to the side, my side. So the unresponsive person is placed on his side, but his elbow is flexed and his knee is flexed, aiming not to prevent the fall of the tongue to obstruct the way, airway. This is another photo presenting how to, pre to put the patient in a recovery position. As you see in the first photo is bending the elbow. The second photo is bending the, the opposite leg and rotating the unresponsive person towards me to put it this position. So to put him on his side or her side. This is called recovery position. Okay, this recovery position will prevent the tongue from falling backward and prevent airway obstruction. Let's see this video together. The recovery position. Check for danger. Check for response. Hello, I'm Emma, I'm the first aid. Are you okay? No response. I would then open the airway, check the breathing, and I'm looking for at least two breaths in a 10 second period. She's breathing, she's unconscious and she's breathing. So just relax your back. So I would then be putting her into the recovery position as quickly as I can. So we'd start by moving her arm out of the way so she's not gonna roll on it. Check the pocket for anything major or anything that's gonna hurt her or should I roll her over. With the other hand, I'm gonna lift fingers I'm going to put that on the side of her cheek. I'm then going to lift her knee and roll her over in one movement. There we go. Then I would unhook her foot to 90 degrees, over like that, and just gently tilt her head and lift her chin if I'm not concerned that she may have a spinal injury. If I was worried, then so long as she's in a position that she would be dribbling, then that'd be fine. And then I would keep checking that she's breathing. I'd cover her, I'd get an ambulance on the way, and then I would keep checking on her. 
So we knew about the recovery position. A recovery position, we said we use it if the patient is breathing, okay? However, if the patient is not breathing unconscious and not breathing, so this heart and lung have stopped. So we have to do something compensatory instead of the heart and lungs. Instead of the heart, we have to do some cardiac compressions, so compression to pump the blood, and we have to give this patient some breath inside the mouth. Okay, and if there is something called the AED or the automatic electro, electric cardio version, we use it if available. However, after COVID, this thing, the breathing thing stopped. If this after COVID, it will do just cardiac compression. And if there is AED, we can use this AED. How to do the cardiac compression? First of all, ensure that this unresponsive child on a hard surface, hard surface like this. Hard surface could be on the floor, but not on a bed because the bed is a not hard surface. And to place him uh, on the hard surface and you should be in a distance that you are empowering or taking charge of his chest. You can extend your both arms and put his, the, your arms over the middle of his chest and clinch both hands and do the cardiac compressions. The cardiac compressions should be done with the elbows extended. The elbows should become both the elbows are extended and the movements come from the shoulder. The movements come from the shoulder, not the elbow flexed because if the elbow is flexed, we can't cause false or unwanted force to the chest. So we, we should have both the elbows or the arms extended and the movements coming from the shoulder. How many compressions we have to do? We have to do 30 compressions, 30 compression. Usually you have to count one, two, three, four. You count and you at the same time you are, after finishing the, the 30, 30 cycle, if is it possible to give mouse breathe or not. Usually with the COVID, we don't give mouse breathe. However, if sometimes if they, you have a, someone around with a mask, if you if found, you can give through a mask. So this is a cardiac compression. We give 30 cardiac compression, aiming to replace the cardiac contractility or the failing heart that is not pumping the blood. Sometimes we find in certain areas uh, 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 something called the AED, automatic electro defibrillator, electric defibrillator. What is defibrillator? The defibrillator is a machine find, found everywhere, sometimes in certain shops, in certain malls, in certain schools. This defibrillator is very important because it can revert the, the stopped heart. It can analyze the stopped heart. How to use this defibrillator? It's very easy and friendly for use. You, and usually it have a speaker that guide the, the, the bystander to know how to use it and where to put these bats and how to use it. Usually the AED, when you use it, you have called the ambulance. And the ambulance will be at the same time, 911 or the A and E will be with the say online with you or, or on the phone while you are using this machine. And they will be guiding you how to use it. First of all, you have to press the in and in, in, in off, which is the power button, okay? After putting the in pattern, the, the power, then it guides you to put this training pads and where to put it. And there is a photo on the pads that guides you that this pad will go on the left side and this pad will go on the right side. So it's it have a photo on it, you stick the pads. After you stick the pads, they, it's telling you, the machine will tell you this machine is analyzing the heart rhythm or analyzing this patient rhythm. And after it make analysis for this rhythm, it advise you, the machine itself advise you either to give some shock for this patient or not, give shock or not. And if it advises you to give shock for this patient, the most important thing that everyone should be away and not touching this patient. So again, the AED, how to use it? The AED is found in many schools, many malls, many shopping malls, many 
public areas. And usually when you reach to, 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 to this, use this EAD, the 911 service will be with you on the phone. First of all, you press the power button. After this, you put the pads, attach the pads for this patient. And the, the machine will itself analyze the rhythm for this patient. If this patient is a shockable or something advised to use this AED for, the machine will tell you, please, ad shock is advised. Shock advised, if the shock is advised, you have to tell anyone around this patient to clear away from this patient. Because if I shock and someone is touching this patient, this one who's touching this patient may get electric shock and may faint. And you have to, to face two unresponsive patients. So it's very serious that everyone should clear away from this patient. And if everyone is clear, you press this button. So it's a very easy, very easy steps. And after this, you continue CPR like before, which is a cardiac compressions again till 911 comes. Okay. This is another video that's showing the has slow, deep gasps, this is not the same as breathing. Call 911 or direct someone to call. Treat. Press hard and fast on the center of the chest. Place the heel of your dominant hand directly on the center of the chest and interlock the fingers of your other hand. Keep your arms straight and lean over the victim using your body to compress the chest. Push down hard. You need to compress the chest at least two inches and push two times every second or 120 times per minute. Allow the chest to recoil completely with each compression. If the victim is on a soft surface, like a bed or a couch, move them to the ground before beginning compressions. You may have heard in the past that you must do mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth is not needed for adults or teens and could be harmful. Perform chest compressions only. However, mouth-to-mouth -mouth is needed for young children and infants. While performing chest compressions, direct someone close by to get an AED. The AED, or Automated External Defibrillator, is the only thing that will shock the victim's heart back into normal function. When the AED arrives to the victim, simply turn it on and follow the voice guided instructions. Unit OK. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Attach defib pads to patient's bare chest. Don't touch patient analyzing. Don't touch patient analyzing. Shock advised. Don't touch patient. Press flashing shock button. Shock delivered. 
Start CPR. The AED will only deliver a shock to someone who needs it, so do not be afraid to put it on anyone who is unconscious. Now that you know how to act, let's watch this again. Okay, are you okay? You, call 911. You, get an AD. Keep your arms straight and lean over the victim using your body to compress the chest. Push down hard. You need to compress the chest at least two inches and push two times every second or 120 times per minute. Unit okay. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Attach defib pads to patient's bare chest. Don't touch patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Press flashing shock button. Shock delivered. Start CPR. In many instances, an ambulance or other medical professional can be five to 10 minutes away or more. Continue chest compressions while rotating compressors every two minutes until help arrives and continue to follow the instructions of the AED or 911 dispatcher. You be the hero. Teach your friends and family to act now. So to summarize our lecture today, we took about uh, first aid for common pediatric emergencies or accidents. First of all, we talked about the first aid kit that we advise to be available in every house, in every outing, in every picnic, if some people are going out. What are the contents of this first aid kit? Sometimes it's well prepared and it's ready made. And sometimes we have to put it itself, ourselves. We have to put some scissors, some scissors, some bandage, some elastic bandage, uh, aspirin and paracetamol uh, and some cream, hydrocortisone cream for this, uh, high, this first aid kit. Then we talked about shocking and we talked about the Hamlet maneuver. In the shocking, first of all, we advise the patient who is shocked to cough, cough forcefully. And he is coughing effectively, so it's okay, we don't have to do anything because cough usually will help in expelling this shock, the, the material he's shocked in. And if the shock, the cough is not helpful, we can do some back slaps, five back slaps. And if it doesn't help, we do the Hamlet maneuver, which is the abdominal thrusts, abdominal thrust. We do five abdominal thrusts, and then we reassess the patient if the patient is breathing or not, okay? If the patient is not breathing after these back slaps and jaws and abdominal thrusts and is turning more blue and not breathing, we should call 911 and start CPR that we talked about at the end. So we talked about shocking. Then we talked about asthma, bronchial asthma, which is very common in children, especially in these days. And we, we spoke about the evohaler or the blue inhaler, which most of the asthmatic patients have in their pockets. And we said how to use it. And you have to reassure these patients and give up to 10 puffs of this inhaler, okay? After this, we talk about the anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis, which is allergy or severe allergy that can cause airway obstruction. And we said that usually these allergic patients will have EpiPen or adrenaline pen in their hands or then pockets or then bags because it's a very life-threatening condition, and usually it's prescribed for them as a rescue therapy. After that, we talked about unresponsive, unresponsive child or unresponsive per person. And we talked as about unresponsive. First of all, you check the safety of the scene. The scene is safe. Everything, there's nothing causing danger for you and for anyone around. First is safety. After this, you stimulate this unresponsive person. Are you okay? Are you okay? Try to stimulate him if he's hearing, if he's giving any response or no. And third thing we have to do, shout for help. So it's three S. First, safety, stimulate, and shout for help. Three S, shout for help. 
shout for help, call the nine, the emergency department service, or shout someone help me, or assign someone to call this emergency service. And after this, you have to check if this patient is breathing or not. To check the breathing, we have to open the airway first. We do something called head tilt, chin lift. We, we open the airway by extending the neck and doing head tilt, chin lift to open the airway. And we do the maneuver called look, listen, and feel. What's look, listen, and feel? We look for the eye, for the chest drive, and we listen and we feel this air or breathing sounds coming of the unresponsive. If this unresponsive person is breathing, we put him in the recovery position, as we said before. If it's not, he's not breathing, then we have to do cardiac compressions till someone gets the EED and analyze this rhythm for this patient, unresponsive patient or victim. And after this, we continue the CPR according if the patient needs shock or not. Uh, this is a rapid summary for today. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be with you today. And I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Iman, for your um, very educational talk. Uh, a few questions came in. And the first question is, how strong is the Pause, please, and any harm if I do it wrong. How, how, sorry, I didn't get the question. Okay, so the first question goes, how strong is the applause, please, and if, is there any harm if I do it wrong? The blows for the shocking, you mean? Yeah, yeah. For the shocking, you are, you don't push for, for the kids, you don't push so hard. For others, you have to push so hard. And is what, there harm any could harm happen? If... what harm could happen for the kids? We don't push so hard because sometimes it could injury to the ribs in the front because you are supporting with the, with the rib, with your hand in the front of the patient. If this you if you are blowing so give back slaps very strong, sometimes you can compress and cause rib fracture. But if you weigh this harm rib fracture to some airway obstruction and serious morbidity for this patient, rib fracture is nothing for this, but it, this is the harm that could happen. For others, we don't so, see so much rib fracture in this procedure. So it's okay to do to use some, uh, some good force for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the second question, uh, what about using uh, cortis, uh, corticosteroids for asthma? Using, sorry? Uh, corticosteroids for asthma yes you i cannot get using what for asthma uh corticosteroids 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 yes what form of corticosteroids usually we use oral corticosteroids if this patient is a known asthmatic uh the uh, the form was not specified Yes, oral corticosteroids can be used, but it's not a rescue because oral corticosteroids take, take some time to work. But this uh, inhaler or this uh, blue inhaler, the salbutamol, works on the, on the spot. However, oral corticosteroids, if we, if we use it, it needs some time to get into the stomach and to be absorbed into the circulation and get to the blood and to do its desired action. So it's good, it's sometimes good to use it, but it's not a rescue, not a first aid emergency. And usually the corticosteroids is had to be pre prescribed by the doctor in the hospital. But this uh, salbitamol or blue inhaler, usually most of the asthmatists are carrying it in their pockets or their, or their bags. So it's, it, the, the corticosteroids is good to use, but it's not a, a first rapid response reaction. Okay, thank you. Uh, the third question goes, uh, are the inhalers similar for both adults and children? So do both adults, adults and children use the same kind of inhaler or? Yes, yes, go? yes. Inhaler for adults and for kids is the same. The, the, the inhaler, the blue inhaler. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the fourth question goes, uh, my child can't use the inhaler. What about the spacer? 
the spacer. The spacer, usually we use the spacer for younger children because they cannot control uh, their breathing. They cannot control it. So we give it through this evohaler or the aero chamber because they, it's something like you create a chamber and this chamber, they are breathing through this chamber. So it's better to use it for younger children below eight years. And some, some papers are talking below 10 years. Right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, our fifth question goes, can I perform CPR for a choked child? CPR for? A choked child, a child is choking. Yes, you can perform it for a choking child if after doing the, the back slaps and the abdominal thrusts and you fail and this patient is turning blue and he's not breathing. And he stopped breathing completely and turning blue. And now his, his heart is failing. Uh, heart is not working. Uh, lung is not full of air. You have to work for CPR for him. Yes. The answer is yes. But after doing the back slaps, the abdominal thrusts, and it's not working, and this patient is turning blue, and there is no breathing sounds, you do the look, listen, and feel he is not breathing. Then you put him on the, on the floor because we have to do um, a hard uh, surface and you start this CPR. Okay, thank you. And finally, what's the difference between allergy and anaphylaxis? What's the difference between allergy and anaphylaxis? Yes. Right? Anaphylaxis is a severe form of allergy. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, anaphylaxis is a severe form of allergy. Allergy is a wider term that can include some skin allergy, some gastrointestinal allergy is a broader term, but the severe form, the, the life-threatening one is called the anaphylaxis, which we discussed today. All right, okay. Well, um, these are all the questions that we have for uh, for tonight. Thank you very much for your uh, for your presence and your attendance, and thank you very much for the talk that you gave us. It was truly educational and very informative. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you today. Thank you. The pleasure is all ours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you in the next session. Don't hesitate to follow us on our social media platforms as seen on this screen. For more updates and information on the Egyptians Together Union, please visit our official website on www.egyptianstogether.com. Also, for any questions or queries, please contact us via email on egyptianstogetheruk at gmail.com. Also, for more videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel called Egyptians Together. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you in the next session. Thank you.